Now it didn't take off right away. You had to take it some action. It didn't take off at all. No, it's, uh, they they had one printing and they expected it to do very little, and, uh, and they met their expectations. Yeah, <laughs> they were. They told me they had what they call a list mentality. They said, "This is the list. You're on the on the, on the March list." And it's a clever little title, and it's a nice little book. And if, if we sell the books that are on our list, they had a printing, first printing of 3,500, then, then we'll be happy, and you'll make a little money, and we'll make a little, and then we'll move on to the next list in April, and, and so on. And that was the mentality. And that's a big part of the mentality in publishing yeah, today, as you, as you know. So I just said, well, what will happen if the first printing sells out? Just if. I know it won't. I mean, that's what you're saying. It won't. But just if. His name was Lou. All right? Right. And Lou said, wait. He said, you're an unknown. He said, it's 3,500 books on hardcover at $7, $6.95. I mean, that was like an outrageous price to, to put on the book at that time. I said, but just if. And he said, uh, well, if they do, we'll have to put a second printing. I said, okay, fine. And so I became, uh, they wouldn't let me buy them. I tried to buy them. They wouldn't let me. So I became a bookstore. I was in New York at the time, and all you have to do to become a bookstore is just give them a number in Albany, and you're a bookstore. So I became a bookstore by just giving them a, uh, a tax number. And, uh, and through that tax number, which I gave them the address of the bookstore that my garage was to become in, uh, <laughs> in Long Island, it's true. And I called that day, and I ordered 3,350 copies of your erroneous zones, and they were, shipped, they were shipped to the garage. So you sold it out. I sold it, and I went back to Lou. <laughs> Two days later, I said, Lou... What will happen if we, if we do so? He said, Wayne, you've got to stop bothering me. You know, it's like you're another one of these beginning authors. I said, well, just check. Just check the computer. Just see how it's doing. Because I said, I've been doing a lot of speaking. And, and I think, <laughs> and he went to his computer. It's a true story. His, uh, I could even tell you his last name, Gullickson. And he went to the uh, computer. He said, oh, my God, this book is doing fantastic. We sold out the whole first printing. So they ordered a second printing, 1,500. They didn't want to take too much of a check. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I bought all those up, too. Oh, I bought the gosh. second printing. And, th and by that time, they didn't have any money for distribution. They didn't have any advertising money. They didn't have any of that. They just, right. Because they just didn't do that in those days. So I said, I'm going on the road. And I quit my job as a professor at St. John's. I walked in and I had, you know, I had all these publication credits and I was like a rising star there. And they right. said, uh, you're insane. You've got guaranteed tenure for the rest of your life. You've oh, got a boy. position. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, you can be, you can argue for your misery for the rest of your life, you know. And, uh, and, I, and I resigned. And everybody thought I was nuts except my wife and I. We both knew that this was, this was the right thing. The day I resigned from doing something that I no longer wanted, was totally involved in. I was good at it, but I didn't want to do it. It was like drill. You know, I mean, yeah. after you've drilled enough, sure. it's just enough. Drill is drill, yeah. okay? But you don't need to keep doing it. I learned that in the military. <laughs> so uh, I, I, walk, I drove home on the Long Island Expressway that day, the freest man I'd ever felt. I knew I was about to follow my bliss. I really knew it. And I didn't have any guarantee of any income or anything. The interesting thing about that is that uh, in the following year and a half, I made more money. I was 36 years old now at that time. I made more money without even trying. I never thought for a minute that I would make money because I hadn't made any money on anything I'd written yet. I wasn't writing for money. I was writing because writing was just something that I, that's who how I expressed yeah. myself. That's just who I am. And I made more money in the next 18 months than I had made in the previous 35 years of my life, like by, 10, by a factor of 10. And uh, you're just going out sharing your philosophy with the radio I took, station. I took the books in a station wagon across the country, and I, I would. This is the way I did it. If you want to know how I yeah. did it, I would arrive in a town like uh, Columbus, Ohio, where they have these. They, they have Good Morning Columbus on the radio, you yes, know. And if you've sure. got a new avocado dip, you're on for an hour. You know, what I mean? <laughs> they're looking for people. Okay, every station's got a talk show. So you just have to find out who they were. And I had a girl back in Chick in New York named Donna Gould, who was working for the publisher, but was willing to work for nothing at night. For just because she loved erroneous zones and loved me and loved the, the, the whole thing. I mean, she was just involved in the whole process. She really loved it. And so she would call these different stations and all that and book me uh, on Good Morning Columbus and Good Afternoon Columbus and Hello Columbus <laughs> and Goodbye Columbus and, you know, and all of this kind of thing. P.S. Columbus. Yeah. <laughs> and I would... Uh, I, I would have my car full of books. I would arrive in Columbus. I was sleeping in the car. I mean, I did this. I, I had no money oh to do this. With, right? And I would sneak showers. I would figure out how to take free showers, you know, <laughs> in, in days ends and things, you know. But you had a committed day, wife. Yeah, now, was right. your wife traveling Oh, with yeah. You? Well, sometimes. 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 She was oh. also working. Wow. And um, I would go to the bookstores. 
And first, I would telephone them on, uh, call them up, and I'd say, uh, "Have you got a book called Your Erroneous Sounds?" And I would do it in like nine different dialects. <laughs> you have Wur, Erroneous, Erroneous, Yazida, and then I'd do it in German, and I'd do it in Dutch, and then my wife was with me; she would call, and, and I'd get these people to call and ask for Erroneous. It's true. This is exactly what we did. Shame, 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 the demand. Shame, I love us. it. I love it. <laughs> And, and the, but, but I knew I was going to create the demand. I mean, yes. I didn't think I was doing yes. any, anything you know, immoral. I was yeah. just creating the demand for yeah. what, it, what it was that I believed in. Yeah. And I, besides, I had 5,000 books I had to get rid of because <laughs> I had no distribution at all. So, uh, you were what we call committed. <laughs> that's right. I was oh. totally involved in the process. And then I would go on the air. Okay. Yes. And, and I would do uh, what we're doing now. Yeah. I never tried to sell my books. I never gave the title out. I never said, oh, by the way, my new book is called, and oh, yes, my book is this, and yeah. you've seen this on the air. Sure. And every time somebody does that, you say, well, they're, you know, they're not involved in it. They're just yeah. trying to sell me something, yeah. and you move away. I didn't do that. I was just selling myself as a person. I was just talking like we're talking. Yeah. And when people talk and are committed and are involved and are authentic and are enthusiastic about what they're saying, People respond. People want to know yeah, more. Yeah. They just want to know more. It's why I let everybody tape all my talks. I never deny anybody to tape my talks to this day. Yeah. In fact, I not only allow it, I insist on it. That's and nice. I don't take a, th a cent for it. Anytime I speak, I say, if I'm on purpose, rather than an outcome, yes. if I'm on purpose and in the process, then my purpose is to get the message out. That's where I've got to be centrally focused. Not on what's going to come back to me, not on royalties, not right. on, just on that. So I allow every church, every organization, you can tape me and you can do anything you want with the tapes. Anything you want. You want to sell them to your customers and all of that. Just don't put them into bookstores and, and make a, a legal conflict yeah, for me with publishers. For it, sure. yeah, just legal problems. Sure. But otherwise, do anything you want with them. Because I figure all that can happen is something good. What can happen if uh, somebody hears an interview of mine other than they say, Gee, I want to hear more of that guy. And off they go to the bookstore, or off they That's do, right. they call for the tapes and all that. Nothing but good can happen. That's true. And then you keep circulating and so on. So, I mean, I, le I learned that about three years ago when my agent kept saying, you can't tape Wayne Dyer. Now I have a clause in there that says, I insist that you tape me. <laughs> <laughs> and do whatever you want with the tapes. That's true. So, That's true. so I was, like, on that process. Then I would finish at the interview, and I would go to the same bookstore, and I'd say, by the way, I'm here in Columbus the little professor bookstore, this is the one of them I can remember very well. And I said, I just did AM Columbus, and I'm going to do this afternoon's Columbus, and I'm going to do all of this. And, I, and the guy said, my God, we've already had 10 phone calls. Well, I knew I'd made them. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, can I just leave 25 of my books here, and if they don't sell, then uh, you can send them back to me, and here's the address, right. and it won't cost you anything. Just send them back to you. Sure, he said, absolutely. We've already had calls for them. And sure enough, they were getting calls. People yes. were going in there. Sure. And, and that's how I distributed my book. From, I did that in Columbus. I did that in Baltimore. I did that in Jacksonville. I did it in Tampa. I did it. I went to every, almost every, I shouldn't say every state, but I went to about 75% of the states in the country wow. at my own expense, in my own little car, six months on the road. And then finally, the book hit the bestseller list. And it was interesting because The Tonight Show was the show that everybody wanted to get on in those days. That's when it was an hour and yes. a half. And uh, that story is so phenomenal. I don't know how our time is. We're fine. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, the story of, of getting on that show, because my... Donna was always trying to get me on the show. You know, she'd call it tonight, so she'd call him and she'd call him and they'd say, if we hear the name one more, Wayne Dyer one more time, I'm not... It turns out that a friend of mine now, a very good friend named Howard Papish, was working on the show as a, and someone had placed the, a copy of Erroneous Zones in his uh, briefcase and he was flying back to, to uh, Los Angeles and he happened to pick out that book and read it on the plane. Well, he called me and he asked me if I would be willing to fly out to Los Angeles and do a pre-interview for The Tonight Show. I said, no, I'm busy putting up my screens. I can't do that. What do, you, what, do you, what do you mean, can I come out to Los Angeles? Sure enough, I flew out to Los Angeles, and I went out there. And it's so interesting, when you, when you get off of trying to get something yes. and just stay on purpose, yes. it's that great quote from Thoreau, if you advance confidently in the direction mm -hmm. of your own dreams, endeavor to live the life which you've imagined, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. You want to talk about an unexpected thing. I couldn't get on one national show, Tony. I couldn't get on the Donahue show. I couldn't get on the Today show. I couldn't get... These are all shows that I've done a hundred times since. Yes. But I couldn't get on any of them because they said that, you know, who are trying you? Trying to force it. Yeah, yeah, and I was forcing it. That's right. I was pushing it. But there's another way to reach everybody in the country. And that's to go to everybody in the country. If, if they yeah. won't put you on network television, you can still go out there and do it if you're committed to, to wanting to do it. So I go out there and I do the pre-interview. And it's, a, it's, the, it's the Republican National Convention, 1976, Kansas City. Bob Dole is going to give the, uh, uh, the keynote address. Now, I 
had such a, uh, an angry feeling towards Bob Dole because I got on the show, okay? I got on the show from the result of the pre-interview, and Shecky Green was the host. You know who Shecky Green is? No. Great, great comedian in Las Vegas. Super, super guy. One of the nicest guys in the world. And uh, he's he very fun. does a thousand different dialects. You must get to meet Shecky. He's a great guy. And he was hosting the show. And he asked me if I would, uh, you know, so I, I get on the show. All right? But it's Monday. But the show, for the first time in the history of The Tonight Show, gets preempted because Bob Dole, <laughs> instead of giving a 45-minute speech, gives a two-hour speech. And it goes over and the show's preempted. So I fly back to Detroit, where I'm back there with my wife. And I find out that the show's preempted. And I'm all excited. I'm telling everybody that in the world that I know that I'm on The Tonight Show that night. And it gets preempted. So, you know, it's like uh, one door closes, Humility, yeah. another door opens, opens yeah. another door opens. It always works this way. When, you are, when you're doing what you're supposed to and getting off. Of, so that was Monday night. Tuesday, Johnny Carson comes in to his meeting with Howard and all of them. And, says, uh, and they said, we had a guest on last night that was fabulous. He said, he said the audience just went crazy over him. And Carson said... Uh, well, if he was that good, he said, I'd like to have him on before they show that preempted show, which, which was scheduled for a week from the following Monday. They were going to just set it in there. So I get another call from uh, Will you from fly Los back? Will you fly back? <laughs> this time when I fly back, there's a limo, and I got oh. a first-class ticket, and you know, things have really changed. And I've got my own dressing room. The first time I went in there, it's like, you can dress in the toilet over here. <laughs> now I'm in there, and they're pressing my clothes, and they're cutting my hair, which is really like a, you know, not a big job. But, you know, they charge for a search fee when they do mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I go on the show on Wednesday night, this is like two nights later, and I go on with Carson, and Carson says, and we, we only have maybe uh, seven or eight minutes, it was, it was just great, it was super, he was so good to me. And he said to me, you know, this isn't enough time for this. This is really terrific. He said, could you stay over till Friday? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and do the show again on Friday because, you know, he checked with Freddie DeCord. And I said, no. I said, no, screens. I can't do it. I got to get back. <laughs> so I stayed over till Friday, did the show on Friday. The preempted show showed on Monday. And from not having any national exposure at all across the country, I went from just doing AM Columbus and all these shows all, all, all over to getting net, three network appearances in five days. Wow. And the book went from, it was on the bestseller list at that time, before I hit the Carson show for the first time. I got it on the, on the bestseller list by just going across the country as yeah. an unknown. I uh, got on The Tonight Show, did it three times in five days. The Donahue Show started calling us. The, you know, I did the Donahue Show three or four times there, and then the, uh, the Today Show, and, and, it's, and it became a... You know, it became like, like the biggest. Yeah. It, well, it became the biggest bestseller of the '70s. It was the top-selling book for the entire decade, and it was all because I was advancing. Com I was doing what made sense to me. Yeah. You know, today I don't do that. Today I don't. I don't go out and, and do it that way. I do it another. I trust it'll all work out in another way. I'm well, you've built you've built it also. But I think it's really. I really appreciate you sharing the story because a mm. lot of times I think people have interpreted your philosophy to mean just let things happen. And the truth is, you're surrendering, but you're act it's, it's faith with work. You as know, it's you faith think, with action. As you think, so shall you be. Right. Okay, so you act upon what you think about. Yes. If you're thinking about what's missing, if you're thinking about the scarcity in your life, if you're thinking about what's wrong, if you're thinking about what you don't have, if that's where your thoughts are and what you're constantly thinking about and processing your world that way, then that will be what you have to act on. You have to act on what's missing. It's just like in a relationship. If you think about what you don't like about somebody in a relationship, then you have to act upon that. Yes. Your relationship is really not located in another person. It's located in you, where everything is located, in that invisible part of you. Do you know what everybody said about uh, the reason why Erroneous Zones was so successful? No. It was, the, it was the 70s. It was the me generation. It was the exact right timing. Dyer was lucky. He hit it at the right... You know, they don't know how many... But that I put 45,000 miles on my car one summer, yeah. you know, and that I went out and bought all of those books and all that. It's like and took successful the people yeah. are very, very lucky. Just ask any failure. <laughs> <laughs> They'll confirm it for you. This is true. This yeah. is true. Yeah. What is the most important... Uh, you've shared a couple of lessons, but if you were going to say the most important, say, three lessons you've got in the last 10 years that you would share with people, what are they? I know it's at the top, and that is uh, you become what you think about. Yes. Uh, if you want love in your life, um, send love out. Have love within you. Be loving. Yeah. If it's like I think of the orange. I always give the analogy of the, if you squeeze an orange, what comes out is what's inside. It doesn't matter who squeezes it or what time of day or what instrument you use or what the circumstances mm. are. You can only get out of an orange what's inside. And if you extend the metaphor to yourself and someone squeezes you, that yeah. just puts pressure on you or says something or whatever, behaves in a way towards you that you find objectionable. And out of you 
comes anger or hatred or tension or stress or bitterness or, or any of that. It isn't because of who did the squeezing it, or the circumstance. It has nothing to do with that. As much as we like to convince ourselves of that, yes. it's because that's what's inside. And what's inside is always within our own control. I think the second thing is that uh, Robert Frost said, uh, we all sit around in a ring and suppose while the secret sits in the center and knows. <laughs> <laughs> And what mm. the secret in the center that knows is, is what it is that constitutes your very life. It's like um, this room we're in right now is only a room, not because of the walls and the configuration and all the form that's in here. It's because of this here that, that neither one of us can get a hold of, this silent, yeah. empty, invisible space surrounded by form. That's what, like in Zen, they say it's the space between the bars that holds the tiger. <laughs> mm. And it's the silence between the notes that makes the music. See, music isn't notes. It's silence between notes. You aren't form. That isn't what makes you who you are. What makes you who you are is the invisible and surrounded by form. That's the secret that sits in the center and knows. Once you know that and make contact with that and realize that that is, that is who you are, that it is, it is out of nothingness, it is out of emptiness. It is out of that silent, empty space that you create every thought, yeah. every sound. When you go to make a sound, the sound comes from that nothingness. You know? So nothingness, what we call nothingness, which is everythingness, which is the Tao, you know? yes. and the Tao that can be described is not the Tao. You can't describe it. It just is. It's, it's, it's in every one of us. Once you know that and go there and consult that, then you can not only affect your own physical life, but you can truly affect the physical life outside of you. Deepak and I were having lunch. Deepak Chopra and I were having lunch up in Seattle this day. And we talked about doing this new program. We talked about there are four ways. To, we were just playing, toying. We yeah. said there are four ways to get strawberry ice cream. So let's, let's think of the four ways to get strawberry ice cream. You know, and he talks in this very wonderful Indian accent. Yes. You know, Indian accent in yes. India. You know, yes. I talk with a funny Detroit accent. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there's a, there's a lot more people in India than there are here. <laughs> So we're talking about what are the four ways to get strawberry ice cream? And I said, well, if I want strawberry ice cream, I just have to have a thought. And the thought is, I want some strawberry ice cream. Now I'll just go get it. Okay, yes. so I go off to haagen or I go off to the grocery store, and I get so, so that's like a thought, and then you act on the thought. Now there's a second way to get strawberry ice cream, and that is to have a thought, and then to send one of your kids to get strawberry ice cream. <laughs> it's called slavery, okay? It's like, I want some strawberry ice cream, go get it for me. So you have a thought, and then somebody else goes and gets it for you. That's the second way to get strawberry ice cream. A little higher level, consciousness. You don't have to work so hard. You've got somebody else doing it for you. There's a third way to get strawberry ice cream. And the third way to get strawberry ice cream, which Deepak offered, he said, you just think, I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream. And then someone walks by and says, uh, excuse me, is this your strawberry ice cream? <laughs> and you say, wow, yeah. I was just thinking of that. And now like, everybody listening has had that experience. Absolutely. Where you just think of, you, know, you think of your sister and you haven't seen her in seven years, and yeah. all of a sudden she's calling you or yeah. whatever. And it's like you have affected. You don't think you have. You just think that's some hunt. Coincidence, that's some yeah. coincidence. But we know that there's no, that there's no chaos, that there's yes. order in chaos at the subatomic level. We know that. So it's like you think of something, and then it just, it just appears for you. And people say, well, if there's three ways, what could be the fourth? <laughs> and, and we were sitting there and said, well, let's see. I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream. And you manifest it. Yes. You just manifest it. Yes. Or as Christ said, even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. I mean, the gift of fish and loaves, the gift of feeding others, the gift of... of and what do you do when you go to sleep and when you're in pure thought? But everything you need for your dream, you manifest. So you need a Lamborghini? <laughs> you need someone to chase you with a knife? You need a father that's going to abuse you? you, need, yeah. you whatever yeah. characters you need for your dream, you create it. Now when you wake from your dream, you don't look back at your dream and say, where's my Lamborghini? Because listen, folks, everybody knows it's neurotic to be attached to an illusion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, why would anybody be... So all you have to do to learn not to be attached to this illusion is to die while you're alive. You know, mm. that's what the Sufis say. When you die while you're alive, you look back on your life and you realize that you can't own anything. You can't have any of it. Yeah. So what you do is you detach yourself from it. And the more you detach yourself from it, the more you get. Mm. And that's the great lesson. What, who is Wayne Dyer? <laughs> I know he's a spiritual being, but yeah. what are your metaphors for yourself? Who are you besides that metaphor? That metaphor is so all-inclusive. Yeah. My metaphor is that I am not in the world. The world is in me. 
I really, I really, I really feel that 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 the uh, that in every cell of my being, the universe exists. It's like I, I'm, I'm like a pharmacy. <laughs> I mean, I can create. What, what do I need for uh, to heal this body? For example, if healing is what I'm talking about, who Wayne Dyer is is this uh, ability to, if I need Valium, to create it. Sure. Deepak tells me the story of when he went to when he went to London, and there was a guy next to him drinking. Uh, he had eight drinks before they had gotten halfway there, and finally he said to him, he said, "Look, he said you're my buddy. He said I'm going to buy you a drink." And Deepak said to him. I'm making my own. <laughs> 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 and it's like That's knowing great. that. Like, yes. I, mean, I know that who I am is those birds you hear out here right now. I mean, when I, when I see them flying, I soar with them. That's who I am. I am all of it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not separate. I'm not even separate from you. Like I said before, it's like I can wiggle this finger because I believe that there's a connection between some kind of a thought which is invisible and the wiggling of this finger. But I can't see that connection. I can't get a hold of that. And if I believe in the oneness of it all, that means that if you can wiggle your finger, that same oneness is there. Yeah. I've got to detach myself from my separateness and believe that, that I can't be you. I, I am it all. I am, I am the sun that comes up in the morning, I am the birds that, that fly, I am the flower, I am that, that invisible force that is in every living thing that allows it to be. That's how do you, who I am. How do you help somebody who sees themselves as separate not only from life but every sense of life? How do you help somebody like that to bridge the gap to where they remember who they really are? The only way you can do it, I think, and I've been at this business a long time of, of trying to help people and writing books about it. A lot of books I wrote long before Erroneous Zones that were about counseling and, and was a therapist for years. I think that the, the notion of that when the student is ready, the teacher, teacher will appear. appear. Yeah. So it's like all I can do is help people to, be, to get ready. That's all I can do. Yeah. And see, I mean, I picked up the Bhagavad Gita three years ago. Okay, Now, I had, I've had the Bhagavad Gita in my library since I was in college, but I've never read it. And I've seen it on... Uh, you know, th I've sure. seen it a hundred times. Sure. So finally one day I'm here and I pick up the Bhagavad Gita and I read it and I say to myself, it's about time they wrote something like this. This is really <laughs> terrific. <laughs> okay. Then I see that it's, it's about 2,500 years old or 6,000 years old or whatever it is. All right? oh, and I, and it's like, but it's been there all along. Yeah. But I wasn't ready. But when I'm ready, it's like shoo, it soars yeah. into my life. And I go to the mailbox yeah. and what I need is, is ready. And it's like we were talking about earlier yes. when I need to give a speech and, and I need to recite a poem or, I, I, or even w with prosperity. If I'm feeling like I need to have more, more money or to more my investments, to be, but it's like it all gets the right person shows up and the right thing it all gets handled yeah. it's like trusting your intuition and knowing that everybody has it so all you can do is help people to get convinced that they have this power within them that it isn't something I have and you don't it's something that you have but you haven't used yet yeah. and the fact that you haven't used it yet is no reason to judge yourself badly or yeah. even to be mad at yourself you ought to be saying I haven't been ready you know, yeah. now I am. And as soon as you acknowledge that you're ready, when the student is ready, then you'll find your teacher's appearing. And your teacher might be like my little kids who walked into yes. y your room. Yes. Or when John asked me, he said, will you do this interview? My first inclination was no. I am here doing something else. I'm here with my family and all of that. And then I got this, uh, I meditated on it, and I got this really nice letter, and it was like, and I thought, uh, I've got to talk to Tony. I've been wanting to talk to Tony. Yeah. And Tony's got something... To, to learn from me, and I've got something to learn from Tony. So uh, the opportunity is here, and we, yeah. we've, we've like missed each other on a lot of occasions. Yes. Of, I mean, we've been with each other, but we've also missed, we've been on the same programs yeah. in the same cities yeah. where you spoke in the morning and I spoke in the evening, and you've been gone and I've been gone. Yeah. And we've been sort of like uh, being thrown at each other, but just sort of missing. Yeah. And I said, w we've both got something to learn from each other, so let's, let's do that. I've heard some things about you from other people, that I didn't like. You've probably heard some things about me that you... I said, the, the way that you get it all in harmony is that you don't ignore it. You don't... Yeah. You go with each other. So yeah. you walk into my house and my children are in love with you in a second. You, you emit a, a, a beautiful kind of spirituality. I see that. Whatever you are going through in your life with the... With, I know there are struggles with, uh, with your fame. I mean, you've come very young, very fast, mm -hmm. very, very powerful, and, and I've got a enormous organization about you and I wanted to say to you I don't want you to get swallowed up by it you know yeah. I want I want the the essential beauty that is within you to to flower 
And to some, sometimes you have to say, I said that's one of the things you've got to say is no. And uh, I, I like to say it, but I'm not as good at it. But I'm a lot better <laughs> at it than I used to be. So it's like what I'm saying is there's a yeah. mutual thing here. There's like... I appreciate the gift, by the yeah, way, very much. Uh, yeah, for, and, it's for, and, and likewise, I appreciate the gift of, of being with you. And so I just let go of, of all of the other stuff. I said, this is, this is a wonderful opportunity. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. And uh, you know what that came from? That came from, from nothingness. That didn't yeah. come from, from anybody telling me how to do it or what I should do. That came from a... a came from a, trust. A, came from my own intuition. Yeah, yeah. trust, surrender. Yeah. But, but my intuition said... See, I told my wife when I got that, I said, I'm not doing any interviews. I, told, I said, I'm not doing this. You know, and she, and she said, you keep saying that. <laughs> 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 me thinks you protested too much. I said, but I'm not doing any interviews. You know, just, and then she said, uh, read, read the letter. And I, and I read the letter and, and I said... She said, what does your intuition say? What is God telling you? you know, oh, what is a, great What question. is God telling you? you know? How may I serve? That's my mantra. How may I serve? How may I serve? How may I serve? Always ask that. Not what's in it for me, but how yeah. may I serve? And, and as, I, as I kept saying that, I said, my intuition says, do it. She said, call him and do it. Wow. And, and that, I have another thanks to make yeah, when I go downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but we <laughs> do that with each yeah. other all the yeah, time. It's like that, and, and that, it's like trusting that intuition, you know. Yeah. That, uh, it's, it's a very, very powerful thing. And it's like it never, ever guides you wrong. The only time I've, in all my investments that I've made since, and I have a whole financial philosophy yes. of, of giving a certain percentage of it away, yes. away unconditionally, yes. and, and also paying yourself first. You know, it's like reinvesting what you make back in, mm -hmm. in, in yourself and in your family and mm -hmm. all that. And the only time I've ever taken a loss financially in any of my investments was when I ignored my intuition once. And I invested in something that was not conducive to the environment. All right? I don't even want to say what it was because it's, yeah. it's n neither my purpose to plug nor to, right. to blame anything else. But my intuition said, no, Wayne, this isn't, they're, they're doing something that is in conflicts with what you believe. Right. But the yields were high. <laughs> yeah. And they were guaranteed. And it was like, and I, and I put $155,000 into this thing. And they, they went bankrupt, and I lost that 155000 but I gained so much. I was going to say, because you never forget those lessons. Yeah, it was such a great lesson. And since then, I've only, every time I invest anything, I always ask, where's this money going? What's it going to be doing? And then it just comes back to me like tenfold. So it's all been made up in, in many, many ways. So it's like I ignored my intuition once, and I, and I paid a price, but I learned it was a great lesson. It was a terrific lesson. What's the purpose of life? Purpose of life is real simple for me. It's uh, Joel Goldsmith has a wonderful book called Parentheses in Eternity, and you are a parenthesis. He says your life is a parenthesis in eternity. It opens at your conception, it closes at your uh, death, but eternity surrounds it. So that there was an instant before you came into form, if you believe in eternity, in which you went from formless to form. The question to ask is not how did I do it? Did I sign up for it? <laughs> did God do it? Is it a Big Bang theory, which is an interesting metaphor, or, or <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? <laughs> or or whatever? It's like don't ask that question because that that's like uh, that's just trying to analyze. That is to break apart something that is not breakable. The Tao is trying to understand the Tao. So to ask the question why? Why would you go from formless to form? The answer to that is so simple for me. It's like I used to wonder about that all the time, and now it's like so simple. You can't get anything while you're here in this parentheses. You can't have a thing. You think you can own it, you don't get any of it. You, it's the, the jewelry that adorns you adorns another in another instant. The house that you own, the, the cars, the, all of that kind of stuff. That's, like, that's just all like a little loan and a little lease and then it's, it's gone. And if you get attached to it anyway, it'll destroy you. So yeah. you can't have anything. Yeah. So if you can't have anything, if you can't get anything while you're here, then purpose must have something to do with, with giving rather than getting. And to me, the purpose of life is to give. The purpose of life is to enrich the lives of others in some way. Yes. The measure of your life will not be in the duration of your life. It will be measured in the donations of your life. Okay? Mm. The, the, mm. What you are able to give of yourself. Because you can't get anything. The only thing you can do with your life is give it away. Yeah. You can just give it away. Every day your form deteriorates a little more. It's heading towards the closing of parentheses. And once you know that, then you know that you can't have anything. You can't stop that. Nobody can stop that. So all you can do is just keep giving your... And the more you give away, <laughs> the more that comes back. What goes around comes around is not just a funny little song title. Yeah. It is a powerful, powerful message. 
and understanding it basically shifts the quality of life. For Why, sure, Tony. It's like getting your life on purpose. Yeah. If your purpose of life is to give, then get your life on purpose yeah. and get everything that you do on purpose. If you're driving a cab, don't be thinking about how much of a fare you're going to get. Yeah. Think about how can I serve this person and let the fare take care of itself. Yeah. If you're a salesperson and you're thinking about my quotas and what I'm going to get, you're not on purpose. If you're thinking about the quotas of the person you're serving, that person is going to send you 21 names tomorrow of people that they want you to serve as well. Yeah. It's like the more you give in anything that you do, if you're a dentist, don't think about how much money you can make. Think about making this person's tooth and his mouth as healthy as it can be. Yeah. The universe will take care of the rest. Purpose means giving, not getting. And once you get that, and, and, and it's like that's how you have to orient your whole business. That's how I've oriented my entire business yeah. of... Uh, my books. Do you know that everybody who writes me a letter gets a book? It's fantastic. No charge yeah. whatsoever, no yeah. expectations, no nothing. And anybody who writes me and says this tape didn't work, they get a free set. Do you know, I don't, no, I don't, it doesn't make any difference. I don't want to hear about it. Somebody wrote me a letter from Seattle and they came all the way over to hear me at that program that I was on that I'd mentioned. I was the keynote speaker, I was yes. the last speaker, and they had to go back because their father was sick and they spent $100 and they couldn't and they were very upset. I sent her the $100 and the set of the tapes of the whole day. Yeah. It's like, that's what I believe in doing. Except when people t tell me I have to do it. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> I think there's one organizing principle for you, and that's freedom. <laughs> that's right. It's because a gift is not a gift when it's somebody telling you what to do. Then it's a, then or it's a debt. they expect it. That's a debt. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't want any debts. We live by the same philosophy yeah. there. I yeah. agree with you. So if you demand from me that I give you something or tell me that I have to give it to you, you're not giving me an opportunity to give. Yeah. You're just giving me a debt. And yeah. I've got enough of those. Yeah. <laughs> This is wonderful. I really it's been great. It's been a great interview. Time. Yeah, I'm it's really, been nice. And I'm it's really like, nervous. it gives us a connection. You know? Yeah. What makes uh, Wayne Dyer laugh? I'd be curious, because I know mm. you're easy to smile and laugh, but yeah. what really, what gives you the most tickle, the most joy in your life? Huh. I think myself. I think I make my, myself laugh, and I laugh at myself. I really what see, a great skill. Yeah, I really see the, the, the folly of it all. Mm. I mean, if you ever listen to me speak in public, most of my laughs are just like poking fun at myself. Yeah. I poke fun at not having any hair. I've been using that for years. You know, I just tell people this is not merely a bald head. It's a solar panel for a sex machine. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? and those kinds. Of <laughs> That's and, great. And also, my children. My children really make me laugh. My baby, especially. I mean, when they're babies, especially yeah. because babies are. I mean, un under say two. You know, they they make me laugh. My little boy. Uh, I only have one little boy, uh, and and six daughters, and. Uh, uh, that little guy, it just, you know, last night, I mean, uh, 11 o'clock at night, we were, we were both laughing so hard in the, in the bed in my little studio. That's where we, where we yeah. go down and sleep at night. And just t telling stories. I ask him, to, he, he always says, tell me a scary story. I said, well, you tell me one. And he, I mean, he just made up the funniest, craziest <laughs> kinds of things. Children make me laugh. Animals make me laugh. But I, I, really, I really laugh at, uh, at the folly of it all. Yeah. I mean... Uh, so many people think that we come into this world and we have just this short time and then it's over. And there's no, there's no joy, there's no laughter in that. To me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm laughing at the... Someone once said that, the, he said, I don't try to make uh, my audience laugh. He said, I try to make God laugh. Whoa, <laughs> that's know? great. And I really like that. It's that's like, nice. uh, yeah. It's, that's uh, nice. Th I think he's laughing all the time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's a wonderful story that Yogananda tells of, uh, of a black man in the South back in the... Uh, 40s and 50s when it was really, really terrible down there for, and he worked in a white church, an all-white Baptist church where they wouldn't allow, but he was the janitor, and he, they wouldn't allow any, uh, any black people to come in and worship, and over and over he would ask the minister, couldn't I just come in and worship with you on Sunday, that's all I really want to do, and the minister said to him over and over again, I can't let you do that, I would lose my job, I would like to, but I can't, so finally he went and got into deep prayer, and, uh, and in his deep prayer he asked Jesus, you know, why? Why, Christ? Why can't I just pray with those same people where I work every Sunday? And Jesus responded to him, I've been trying to get into that church for 20 years and they won't even let me in. <laughs> 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 and and it, it's like it's a metaphor. <laughs> like That's wonderful. They think that they're praying to me, but I, they, I can't even get in. <laughs> so it's, oh, or, or Churchill had a great, one of the great lines of all time. We'll talk about humor and great yes. people. He was a man that I really admired. I remember the day he died. I was teaching at a, uh, at a school in, in Detroit, at Pershing High School in the inner city. And... Uh, <laughs> Churchill was in the hospital, and he was uh, 
prime minister in 1945, and he, just after the war was over, and he was having such a struggle with Parliament and all that, and he had to go into the hospital for surgery, and a nurse came in, and she was she had to give him a bedpan because he couldn't get out of bed, and she was carrying out his bedpan, and <laughs> and he started laughing uproariously, and she said, "What in the world are you laughing about?" And he said, "I was just thinking that that's the first movement of mine that's been carried out since I've been prime minister." <laughs> <laughs> Those oh, kind of, no. you know, and you know, like all of the great ones have, have, have that kind of a sense of humor. That makes me laugh. Those yeah. moments. Yeah, those, that makes me laugh. How do you want to be remembered? I, I don't care if I am. Yeah, I had a feeling that would be your yeah, response. I re I've thought about that and I just... Do you want to be remembered by your children? It doesn't matter. Hmm. Yeah, I just want to be with them while I'm here and, yeah. uh, and love them and, uh, and be as loving as I can. And, and then whatever they do with it, it will be what they do with it. Whatever. See, I always tell my children that uh, that your reputation is uh, is not in your hands. Like yeah. you, you and I both have a, a, a very public reputation, yeah. right? But I've heard some wonderful things about you, and I've heard some really scabby things about you, and and, and vice versa. Right? But it's not your your reputation is located in all the other people. If you give a talk to 2,000 people, you've got 2,000 reputations. <laughs> That's true. And you have no control over it whatsoever. Yeah. You go to school, I tell my children, you go to school and there's 30 kids in your class, and there's, you've got 30 reputations every day. Yeah. And you have no, the only thing you have control over is your character. Yeah. And that, that is yours. So it's like when you do go out into the world, don't be concerned about how you'll be remembered because that's just going to be, if there's 10 million people exposed to you, there's going to be 10 million remembrances. That's true. Just be concerned about your character. And that's what I try to do. I try to walk the talk. Uh, it's clear you do. And I, yeah. I think your greatest gift is that you are a character. Yeah, that's true. I am. <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate this time with you Thank very, you. very much. Thank you. God bless you. God I appreciate bless you. it. Yeah.